It's finally here. We have the data from the 2023 Stack Overflow Developer Survey. This is the largest survey every year of software developers. And this has obviously been a very interesting year with all of the layoffs, the developments in AI and all of these different things. So I'm interested to see what we can learn from this data. The first section is the developer profile. So this should tell us all about the different developers in the world. So it seems like the majority, as far as education wise, have a bachelor's degree with some having master's degrees. And of course, some not having any college degree at all, which is cool to see. It's cool to see that this is a skill you can learn regardless of your sort of formal education. And then professional developers mostly have degrees, but again, it seems like roughly 20% of developers don't actually have a degree, which I think is pretty cool. Learning to code, it seems like most people who are currently learning to code are in school, which makes sense because a lot of people learn how to code in school or they are in school and trying to figure out what they want to do and they give coding a try. So that all makes sense. Then let's see, how do people learn how to code? So online resources, books, I'm surprised to see that that's 51% of people are using books. I don't think I used many books when I learned how to code. I guess I had some textbooks, but honestly, I didn't really read them. Then we have school, online courses, on the job training, colleague, friend or family member, coding bootcamp. That's sort of surprisingly low to me, but I guess there's not that many people actually going to coding bootcamps and hackathons. I don't know if I'd really consider a hackathon as a way to learn how to code, but okay. And then we have people who are currently learning how to code. I guess this could be different than all people when they ever learned how to code. So yeah, it seems like books are sort of on a downtrend with people currently learning how to code, which makes sense. We have more resources online now. And if we go by age, I would assume we'd see the same trend. Yeah, so with younger people, it's only 36% using books with 88% using online resources. And if we go to the oldest demographic, yeah, so online resources, still pretty high, but not as high. And we'll see way more using books. So 80% of this oldest demographic are actually using books to learn which I think makes sense. There's nothing wrong with using a book or nothing wrong with using the internet, just different ways that people grew up learning how to learn essentially. Next, we have the online resources people use to learn how to code. So number one is technical documentation, then Stack Overflow, which feels biased, but okay. Then we have blogs, how-to videos, written tutorials, video-based online courses, online books, online forums, written-based online courses, and a bunch of other options. I do like to see that technical documentation is so high. I feel like this is overlooked sometimes where people just want to go straight to finding a course or a tutorial, which those things are good, but oftentimes the official documentation of whatever it is you're trying to learn is the best place to start. And it's absolutely something you should be looking at. So even if you find a great course or a great tutorial, you should also be looking at the official documentation. Seems like Udemy is the most popular online course platform, which makes sense given just how many courses they have. You do need to be careful when you use Udemy just because there is a big variance in the quality of courses and some of them just haven't been updated in a long time. So you might be getting some old information, but overall I think Udemy is pretty good. There's some good courses on there for sure. So that makes sense to me. Then we have years coding professionally and says 71% of respondents have been working 14 or fewer years, which makes sense to me just again, given that it's not that old of a field and most of these jobs did not exist 15 years ago. So yeah, the majority of people are in the one to 15 years of experience range. This one's always interesting to me, years of professional coding experience by developer type. So of course, senior executives have the most experience. Let's see, educators tend to have a lot of experience with an average of 15 years, which I guess makes sense. People do some work in industry and then go to educate about the industry after that. Then let's see, database administrators, developer advocates. I'm surprised that's so high, though I guess it sort of makes sense. I always thought that'd be a cool job to have. Engineering managers, all the different types of managers. Designers are actually very high at 14 years. Scientists, developer experience. I'm curious where like just backend, frontend, full stack is. Okay, so full stack and backend are both just under 11 years. I would imagine it's not a statistical significance in the difference between these. Let's see, frontend is going to be down here at eight years, which I guess makes sense in the fact that I think it's generally more likely for a frontend developer over time to make a transition to being a full stack developer than it is for a backend developer to make that transition just because Front-end development tends to have the lowest barrier to entry, so it's where a lot of people start, but ultimately some of those people are more interested in other things, so over time they make that transition. Blockchain has an average of nine years of experience, although I guess it's not experience as a blockchain developer, it's just experience and people are switching to blockchain. Then last is student. I guess that makes sense. It's not really a job, but okay, two years of experience as a student. Moving on to developer roles. So just over 30% of developers are full stack, 17% backend, and only 6% are front-end, but I guess that sort of makes sense with what I just said in the fact that a lot of front-end developers over time become full-stack developers. 
So it sort of makes sense that front-end overall isn't that big. There's not that many people specializing in just front-end development. And really everything else like mobile is actually pretty small, which makes sense to me. The vast majority of people are just working on either front-end or back-end development, not working on anything super specific like mobile development or game development or something like that. So geography, it shows the US being the largest, although that's not where there's the most developers. It just means that that is where the most respondents to the survey were. I think there's more developers in India than any other country, if I'm not mistaken. But overall, I guess the US responded to the survey the most. Then for age, we have a pretty normal distribution around 25 to 34 years old. Seems like professional developers are a bit older, which makes sense because people learning to code are going to be younger on average because a lot of these people are still in school, whereas the professional developers are presumably finished with school. So this makes sense to me. And just given how young the industry is and how much it's grown recently, it makes sense that the average professional developer is still pretty young. Okay, so now moving on to technology, this will be things like the most popular programming languages, things like that. For programming languages, JavaScript is on the 11th year in a row as the most commonly used language, followed by HTML and CSS, Python, SQL, TypeScript, Bash, Java, C Sharp, C++, C, PHP, I feel bad for this 18% of people, PowerShell, that's a lot of people using PowerShell. Go, Rust, Kotlin, Ruby, Lua, Dart, Assembly, Swift, Art. Who's just writing Assembly? Okay. Uh, Visual Basic, MATLAB, and it just keeps going. Let's see. Professional developers, roughly the same. Python's a bit lower for professional developers, which makes sense because it's so common as a first language, but a bit less common in industry. It's still super common, but just less common than how often people are using it to learn. So yeah, I would imagine Python's pretty high for learning to code but HTML, CSS, and JavaScript are the highest, which again, makes sense. It's where a lot of people start when they're learning how to code. This is interesting to me. So for the first year, PostgreSQL took over the first spot from MySQL as the most popular database, followed by SQLite, MongoDB, SQL Server, Redis, and then a bunch of other databases. One thing that's super interesting to me about this is how common SQL is. And if we go to professional developers, yeah, the top ones are pretty much all SQL. Whereas I feel like there's such an emphasis right now on NoSQL databases, but at the end of the day, the vast majority of databases out there in the wild are actually SQL databases and learning to code, people are learning MySQL the most. And that's interesting to me too, because I learned MySQL in university and I think we learned SQL Server too, but we never touched Postgres, even though for professional developers, it's the most popular. So you'd think they'd be teaching it, but I actually don't think I ever learned anything about Postgres in any class. No surprise that AWS is absolutely the biggest cloud provider still, followed by Azure and Google Cloud, and then Firebase, Cloudflare, DigitalOcean, Heroku, Vercel, and a bunch of others. For professional developers, it looks essentially the exact same. Learning to code is also similar, but Azure is way lower. So I wonder if there's less people that know how to use Azure than the number of jobs using it. So that could potentially be a good thing to go ahead and learn if you're just looking to try to find some skill that not enough people actually have. I'm not sure if that's true, but that seems to be what this data might suggest. I'm also surprised to see that Firebase isn't higher for people learning how to code. I think it's absolutely the best option if you're learning how to code and just want to lightly dip your toes into the cloud. Highly recommend learning how to use Firebase. Web frameworks and technologies, no surprise to me, Node.js and React are the highest. jQuery is actually still pretty high, which is a bit surprising. Then Express, Angular, Next, see for professional developers. So React is a little bit higher than Node, but it's not going to be statistically significant. Then we have jQuery, Angular, Express. And then for learning how to code, pretty much the same. I'm surprised jQuery is so high. I wouldn't really recommend learning jQuery unless you have a specific need for it just because it's sort of on its way out, but I guess a lot of people are still learning it. So other frameworks and libraries, .NET is number one, followed by NumPy, Pandas, .NET Framework, Spring. This all pretty much makes sense to me. For professional, .NET is at the top, followed by NumPy, Pandas. So again, pretty much the same thing. Learning the code. A lot of people are learning NumPy and Pandas. This sort of makes sense. I feel like data analytics, machine learning, things like this are super popular right now. So it sort of makes sense that these are the types of things people are choosing to learn how to do when they're learning how to code. And then for IDEs, it seems like the vast majority of people are using Visual Studio Code or Visual Studio. IntelliJ is the next most popular, followed by Notepad++, Vim, Android Studio, PyCharm, Jupyter Notebook, Sublime, NeoVim. I hear a lot of people seem to love NeoVim. Let's see, Eclipse, Xcode, Nano, WebStorm, PHPStorm. Shout out to my 5% still using Atom and then a bunch of other things down here. Let's see, professional developers, pretty much the same. 
learning to code also pretty much the same vs code is absolutely king right now asynchronous tools we have jira confluence a markdown file who's just using a markdown file as an async tool trello notion i love notion github discussions okay professional developers pretty much the same thing learning to code very different so learning to code way more likely to use github discussions i wonder if people are using these like in the classroom markdown files notion trello jira okay so actually fairly similar just sort of in a different sort of order and confluence is way less popular for people learning how to code which makes sense it's sort of used at a company level most of the time synchronous tools we have Teams, slack zoom discord google meet whatsapp telegram skype signal google chat and then it goes on professional developers team slack and zoom seems to be the most common then let's see learning how to code discord is the most common here followed by whatsapp zoom google meet i wish more professional teams would use discord Maybe it's just inherently an unprofessional thing, but personally, I just think it's better Slack. I don't know why more companies aren't just adopting using Discord over Slack, but I guess it makes sense that Slack was built for companies and so was Microsoft Teams. So that's sort of what they're going to be more likely to use, whereas Discord has sort of a reputation of being like this gamer thing. But I do think Discord is a great option for these synchronous conversations with your teammates. Next, we have AI search tools. So ChatGPT is obviously the most popular amongst professional and learning to code, although learning to code seems to have more variety. I am a little bit surprised even at like the 10% market share that Google Bard seems to have, just because I don't know why I would use that over ChatGPT. It just seems like a worse version of ChatGPT, honestly, although maybe there's some specific things it is better at. For AI developer tools, GitHub Copilot is absolutely the most popular and it's not even close. Honestly, I've never used any of these others, so I don't know if any of them are good. Let me know if you think they are. But yeah, GitHub Copilot, by far the most popular. Top paying technologies, here it says Erlang is the highest, but here it says Zig, so I'm not sure which one is actually highest. But either way, Zig, Erlang, F Sharp, Ruby, Clojure, Elixir, Lisp, Scala, Perl, Go, OCaml, Objective C. So a lot of these more niche things tend to be what pays the most, probably just because fewer people actually know them. So it's harder to hire for positions that need somebody who's an expert in Clojure, for example. Let's see. If we go down, I'm sure we'll see things like Python. Yeah, so Python at 78,000, TypeScript 77,000. So once you get to the more widely known things, they're going to be more towards the middle. And down at the bottom, we're probably going to see things that are sort of on their way out a bit. Yeah, so things like PHP all the way at the bottom. Surprise Dart is so low. MATLAB sort of makes sense to me just because it's not really used much by professional developers. It's used more in like a math sense. So those jobs just on average probably pay a little bit less. Change in salaries is interesting to me because on one hand, we've had a ton of inflation. But on the other hand, we've had a ton of layoffs, which tends to result in lower average salaries because there's more people looking for jobs. But we actually had a 10% increase overall in median salary. And you can see it different by different languages. So for example, JavaScript went from 65,000 to 74,000 as a median salary in USD. And this seems to be true pretty much across the board. Almost everything's about a 10% gap. The next category is AI, which I'm pretty interested to see what the overall sentiment is in AI, given how much development we've had over the last really just like six months. So let's see, sentiment and usage. So 70% of all respondents are using or planning to use AI tools in their development process this year. So let's see, professional developers, 44% already using it, 25% planning to, and 30% don't plan to. Learning to code seems to be way more likely to be using it, which makes sense because I think some of these tools are incredible for learning how to code. For example, if you don't understand something in some documentation, just paste it into ChatGPT and it can probably give you a pretty good explanation of whatever that thing is you don't understand. So AI tool sentiment, most people tend to be pretty favorable with some unfavorable, some very unfavorable. Professional developers, pretty much the same thing. Learning how to code, also pretty much the same thing, maybe a little bit more favorable, but pretty much the exact same. So the biggest benefit of AI tools seems to be increasing productivity followed by speeding up learning and greater efficiency. I don't know that I believe improving accuracy in coding, assuming they mean like writing less bugs, making less mistakes. I don't necessarily think that's true. Maybe if you use AI very carefully, that'll be the case. But right now AI makes so many mistakes itself that I can't imagine it being a great tool for improving your own accuracy in coding. So on the same note, accuracy of AI tools, it seems like most people somewhat trust them or neither trust nor distrust, with some people somewhat distrusting and some people highly distrusting. I think I'd be somewhere in the middle, maybe at somewhat trust. I think they are, I guess, somewhat trustworthy, but you just need to take what they say with a grain of salt. And it depends on what exactly it is that you're asking them. If you're asking them questions that have been solved many times before, they're going to be much more accurate 
than if you ask them super unique and difficult questions. This one's super interesting. So AI in the development workflow, people currently using it seem to find it most useful for writing code and debugging code, but people interested in using it aren't very interested in using it to write code. They're more interested in it for things like testing code and learning a new code base and documenting code, which I think is actually something it's super useful for. Then people not interested in using it think it's most useful for collaborating with teammates and deployment and monitoring and project planning, whereas writing code they just don't think it's useful for that at all, which makes sense if you're not interested in using it, you probably think it's not good enough to write code, so you wouldn't want to be using it for that, but just interested to see the difference in use cases people who are actually using it versus people who don't want to use it would find from it. Next, we have AI tools in the next year, and the vast majority of people seem to think that over the next year, their process of writing code, debugging code, and pretty much everything is going to be changing because of AI tools. It seems like this is pretty consistent for all respondents. The next category is work, which I'm interested to see how this has changed given the fact that so much has changed in the tech industry over the last year. So employment status for all respondents this year, we see a slight increase in independent contractors, freelancers, or self-employed. So 70% of respondents are employed full-time of professional developers, 80% are employed full-time, 17% are independent contractors, freelancers, or self-employed. 5% are students full-time, and 5% are employed part-time. So this is interesting. For a work environment, only 16% of people are working in person with the rest either remote or in some hybrid. And even by organization size, it doesn't change too much. The larger companies tend to be more hybrid, whereas smaller companies tend to be more remote. But overall, there's very few people who are actually going into the office every single day anymore. Whereas I would imagine before the pandemic, this would have been like 90%. So it's pretty interesting to see how this has changed. Now, salary by developer type. Of course, senior executives make the most, followed by engineering managers. Interestingly, marketing and sales professionals are pretty high up there. Site reliability engineers, cloud infrastructure, blockchain makes sense. There's a lot of demand right now and not a ton of people who actually know blockchain development. I'm surprised to see developer advocates are so high. Let's see security professionals, product managers, hardware engineers. Let's see, where is just like back end, full stack, front end? So front end is at about 60,000. Educators, interestingly, at 65,000. Mobile developer, 68. Let's see, game dev, 71. Full stack, 71. Back end, 76,000. Let's see if we sort by United States. Seems roughly the same, although the marketing and sales professional seems to have moved down a lot. And also just the overall salaries have gone way up. So senior executives at 220. Developer experience 210, product manager 198, engineering manager 195, developer advocates 190. Let's see, so we have back end at 165. And let's see, where is full stack and front end? So, okay, front end 140 and full stack also 140. And then if we go to India, so educator by far is the highest in India. So that's pretty interesting. I feel like that says a lot about a society that they seem to put a lot more emphasis on paying educators well than we do in the United States. Say Germany, marketing and sales professionals are by far the highest. Canada, pretty similar to the US. United Kingdom also seems pretty similar to the US. So coding outside of work, it says 70% of developers code outside of work as a hobby. And I'm curious to know, is this similar in any other field? Like, are there other fields where people do their job outside of work just as a hobby? Or is that fairly unique to coding? Which I think is cool. It shows that people in this industry actually really enjoy it. Of course, there's also a big chunk that are doing it to continue learning, which partially just means that they probably feel like they need to be learning more outside of work, which isn't great. But it is cool to see so many people see it as a hobby, which presumably means it's a thing that they're actually enjoying. Okay, so I have skipped over a decent bit just because I don't want this video to be too long. So if you do want to see all of the survey results, it's down in the description below. Otherwise, make sure to watch this video next. I'll see you there.